so you saw my sermon title is John 14, 15. I've never in my ministry ever had a title that was actually a scripture. And um, so it's kind of a little, little story with that. But uh, before we do get started again, I'm going to encourage you, if you want to write notes, to get a piece of paper, something to write with, I encourage you to write the verses down. I do have several verses. Um, and I do ask you just to uh, fact check me through the course of the week as you review your notes. If you choose to do that, keep me honest for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So earlier this week, I was in a conversation with somebody, and I actually was sharing this story the other day with Pastor Steve. We talked for a while, and, and uh, but I, I was having a conversation with somebody who I will remain nameless out of respect. Um, we, we were talking about John 14, 15. And, uh, you know, their response was that the commandments of God were more valid in the Old Testament times than they are of current times in the New Testament. I've heard that argument a lot over the years. Um, I knew that's what they were going to go with that statement. And they brought up the topic, I didn't, so. But the topic went there. And, and, and so I just, you know, when I got the message, I, I started praying for God to convict me what to preach on. And, and so I think it was Wednesday. Um, I got the call Tuesday that he wasn't going to be here. And I, I got convicted Wednesday. And so this kind of put together... And this was after having a conversation with Pastor Steve. Uh, but with that said, let's, let's go to our Bibles real quick. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 14, verse 15. Um, everybody knows this one is a short verse, but it is, it is a verse that uh, must be recognized. And I'll be reading from the New King James. John 14, 15. And this is Christ speaking. And he says, if you love me, you do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Some translations will say, will keep my commandments, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, it's important to know that. So, this is a very simple verse, would you agree? <clears throat> but I believe it's a very powerful one at that. And of this verse... What word do we specifically want to focus in on? Which one are we going to focus in on this, this passage? What, Love. what word? Love. Love? No. No. We're going to focus on the word commandment. Hmm. Commandments. Love is the most obvious answer, I would agree. But no, what I want to look at is the word commandments. Because I believe today, in today's Christian society around the world, that the, the, the word commandment or commandments or commands is so abused by so many different denominations. And what I mean by that is that so many churches teach today that the commandments, Ten Commandments specifically, have been done away with. And we only live by grace alone. I hear this all the time. In, in, disc, in conversations. Is grace important? Absolutely. Right? <coughs> the only way we can come to the cross of Jesus is through grace. Amen? Amen? It is a free gift. But it just seems like today's church always wants to void the other part of that, which is the Ten Commandments. And that's because Nobody wants to be held accountable today. In the Christian faith, nobody wants to be held accountable because they want to be able to do what they want, when they want, however they want. And that's why so many more so start believing the concept that one saved, always saved, because there's nothing they need to do except, except Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's so wrong. So as, as I said... The commandments get kind of pushed aside. And for this 
person to suggest that the Ten Commandments really had a more powerful impact in the Old Testament and really don't have much relevance in the New Testament are huge red flags for me. So if we live by grace alone, let's obliterate that real quick. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 6, please. Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. You know, my goal today is to be able to let Scripture prove itself once again, the importance of words that are singled out in Scripture. <clears throat> okay, Romans chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. <clears throat> it says, For sin shall not have what? Dominion. Dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under what? Right. This is where most Christians stop. This is where they stop and say, See, this is the passage that says we are under grace, or that we... We are under grace alone and not under the law. Because the law is legalistic. It is a burden. I always encourage people to read the entire context. And I said, well, let's read one more verse. And verse 15 said, what then? And this is Paul speaking, okay? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? What does Paul say? That's Certainly not. So Paul is saying we must honor the law, even though we are under grace. We must. <clears throat> you know, this word commandments, or commands, or commandments, is referring to the Ten Commandments, or the law of God. And this is really where I want to zero in today. Plus... As I said already a moment ago, the word commandments in this verse, in John 14, 15, also includes other commands that God has given us through his word. Now, there's a debate of how many commandments there really are out there. I've heard some over 600, I've heard some over 100, and so forth. But my argument always comes back to the fact, yes, there are other commands that God has given us in his word, amen? But they all come back to the Ten Commandments. If you break one of those other commands that he has brought up in Scripture, it automatically takes you right back to one of the Ten. Because the Ten is the nucleus, it is the core. And we realize you break one command, you break them all, amen? We know that. But at the same token, not all commandments, when you break them, are equal. Do we understand what I'm saying? I believe, personally, and many would argue this point, and many do argue this point, I believe there are some sins that are greater than others. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I believe Scripture strongly indicates that, especially in Matthew chapter 5. Because Jesus really makes a reference to murder, how serious it is, to adultery, how serious it is, more so than perhaps you know, lying, or whatever the case may be. Listen, don't get me wrong. You sin, you break all the law. But, that's why grace exists. The law <coughs> is there as our tool, as our guide. It is to help encompass us that we will want to have the same character as Jesus Christ, as God. Amen? Grace could not exist without the breaking of the law. If the law was kept perfectly by humanity, there would be no need for grace. And that's the truth. So again, I want to go back to my conversation that I had earlier in the week. As I said, the word commandment, or commandments in John 14, 15, this word is also used in Revelation 12, 17, and 14, 12. I brought this up in my conversation. Because they were saying that God's church is going to be glorious, and so forth. Not disagreeing with that. But the argument was, is by grace alone. And that there's nothing you do. 
This is the true characteristic of God's church. And I said, well, let's talk about Revelation 12, 17. Let's talk about Revelation 14, 12. Because in this, it says clearly that here are the patients of the saints. Describing what? What are the saints? His church, right? They're the elect. So, here are the patients of the saints who keep the what? Commandments. Commandments of God. And have the faith and or testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We don't argue that. The argument was that word commandment does not refer back to the Ten Commandments. That it refers to all the other commands in Scripture. Don't disagree with that part. But why are you singling out the Ten Commandments? If the Ten Commandments are the very core essence of Scripture, of God's true character, why does that keep getting pushed aside? It's because nobody wants to be held accountable. My question then followed up, well, you sin, don't you? Well, I hate when you say that. I say it because you never answered the question. I said, what is sin according to Scripture? Well, what do you mean by that question, they said. What is sin? How is it identified in Scripture? I, I don't know what you're saying. I said, yeah, you do. I said, because we've had this conversation before. Sin is the breaking of the law. Is it not? Absolutely. We know that because that's what Scripture tells us. And so the reality of it is that this word commandment is the same word being used in John 14, 15. And that's what I really want to get into, because it is important for all of us. Hey, we all have a Bible, right? How many of us actually take it out and read it? These are questions that we must ask ourselves. But when we actually start reading the Word and studying the Word, it is fascinating to me how God can take one word in my mind, in my heart, and convict me of it, and say, let's go deeper, John. I just feel that overwhelming conviction. And so it just came to this word, commandments. So I looked it up. I studied deeply to what this word meant. And so when you have these moments, and there is a word that convicts you while you're studying. Don't stop there. Don't just read over it. Go deeper. Everybody here has the internet, amen? I'm sure everybody here has a smartphone, right? So the internet's with you wherever you go. Take time. Look up the original language. Look up Hebrew. Look up uh, with Greek and see what these words mean. In this case, I went and looked to what the word meant in Greek, the original language on this word alone in John 14, 15. And so the Greek word being used here is entele or entelos. They're one and the same. So the meaning here is that this word is commonly used 67 times in the New Testament. This same verse, 67 times, one of them was John 14, 15, and also Revelation 12, 17, and 14, 12. So, this perked my interest. And the definition of this word tells us Ten Commandments. It tells us commands. It also specifies in those 67 verses that is being used, the same word that's being used that people are spitting out and spilling on because they don't want to be held accountable. This person won't even acknowledge that they sinned. They have in the past, but the fact that they would identify and acknowledge well, it's just not the same anymore. Sin is sin. When did it change? Yeah. When did the Ten Commandments change? So the reality of it is, this whole discussion, I know this person extremely well. I 
I know this person keeps nine of the Ten Commandments. The only time I ever get the argument is when it comes to the Fourth Commandment. This is when the law of God has been done away with. This is why we live by grace alone today, according to most in the Christian faith. But yet, God's word is still the same. His original language is still the same. Nothing has changed. And this particular word, entele, talks about meaning ten commandments or commands. So, if John, in John 14, 15, says, Jesus tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keeping his commandments, as we talked about during Sabbath school, is a mindset. It is a matter of respect. If you love God, are you naturally going to respect him and obey him? Absolutely. Is there anybody you know in your lifetime who does not sin? Raise your hand. I said that once in a meeting. A man stood up at the back. Excuse me. He stood up, asked for the microphone. He said, My mother in law couldn't be here today. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You know, talking about John 14, 15, you know, it was on the evening uh, before his crucifixion, Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus gave this lengthy private teaching to his disciples. You know, this discourse in the upper room that he was having with his disciples took place right after the Lord's announcement that one of the disciples was going to betray him. And Judas leaves the room. You know, as part of the instruction, Jesus says, if you love me again, you keep my commandments. The unmistakable meaning of this passage is that obedience in Christ's commandments is both a sign and a test of our love towards him. Amen? That's right. Absolutely. Now, the connection between the love for Christ and obedience to him should be and is a recurring theme in the Apostle John's books. Every one of his books he wrote, he mentions this. Amen? John does not run from this because he knows the power of God's love. He knows how it impacted him. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commandments. In fact, this is love for God to keep His commandments. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read it first again. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. First John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Four to back. In verse 2 it says, By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and keep his what? His commandments. And verse 3, For this is the what? Love of God, that we what? Keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? People freak out when I tell them all the time when they want to say that the commandments of God is a burden. I tell them the commandments of God freed me from the power of sin. They freak out. They don't understand that. God's law, if you truly love him and you choose to honor and obey him through his commands, as he has told us to do in John 14, 15, and many other places in Scripture, I promise you, they will free you from the burden of sin. You know, in the same upper room discourse, John quotes Jesus saying yet again. And this is from John 14, 21. And you can also see this in John 15, 14. He says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
So what does Jesus mean when he says, keep my commandments? If Jesus is referring to keeping the list of rules and laws in the Ten Commandments, or does he have something else in mind? The words John uses in the original language are not merely to be understood as obeying a series of moral instructions. These commandments encompass all of Jesus' words and teachings, which, in truth, are God the Father's words. Amen? Absolutely. Jesus often spoke that he must obey his Father. And, and, he, and he shows that in John 14, 23-24. It says, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings or my word. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not on my own. They belong to who? My Father who sent me. Again, John 14, verses 23 to 24. So these commandments involve a full scope of Christ's revelation. Okay, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 37. John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 37. Okay, John chapter 8, verses 31 to 37. And it says, verse 31, Then Jesus said to the Jews, those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are what? Indeed, right? 32, And you shall know the truth, because the truth, what? Absolutely. Is the truth come through his laws? You're darn right it does. Then are his laws a burden? Absolutely not, because we just read it wasn't. 33. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. And verse 36, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen? In verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They did not want to accept the raw truth of God's holy scripture. They wanted it their way, and that's what they did. Okay, also, let's go to the book of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. Verse 44 to verse 50. John chapter 12, 44 to verse 50. In verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Who is he talking about? God the Father, amen? Verse 45, And he who sent, pardon me, and he who sees me, sees him who sent me. And I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him. For, it, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. In verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. So what's the measuring stick God's going to use for judgment? The law. The law. Right? <clears throat> you can't deny that. <clears throat> and verse 49, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting. <laughs> Key word, right? His command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Amen? That's what it's about. You know, we know over here, if we look at John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Amen? 
He came to open our eyes. But only those who believe and receive the truth of who Jesus is are set free. Let's go to John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Let's just find out that these aren't my words, but John the disciple. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except for me. Amen? Okay. So it is so important to understand the power of God's word. It is so important to understand the power of this word commandment. If it was used the same word 67 times in the New Testament, why are so many Christians today trying to sweep it under the rug? That's the question we must ask. Personally, I believe no one wants to be held accountable. And thus, hold to Jesus' teaching or his commandments. Praying to God his Father, Jesus said in John 17, 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. <coughs> they were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed my word. Immediately after Jesus makes a statement, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, he says. He says this in John 15, <coughs> And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor or helper to be with you for whatever, according to John 14, 16. It is so important to know that Jesus says, I am leaving. But I will send you my comfort. I will send you the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide and direct your life. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead you back to me and my teachings. You see, many in the church today, the Christian church around the world, believe that Jesus is still everywhere at one time. The Spirit of Christ is with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Jesus is a human being. He is a fleshly being in heaven. Do we understand that? Anybody have questions on that one? Because when Jesus died, he died in the physical presence. Did he not appear to his disciples after his resurrection? What did he say to them? For a spirit does not what? Have flesh and bones. Okay? Jesus is still an individual in the kingdom of God, but the Holy Spirit brings them to life in our heart. That's why the Holy Spirit leads us back, because the Holy Spirit can be at a million places at one time, amen? amen? Jesus can only be at one place at one time. And I know many would argue that today, because they want to believe that he's now a spirit being once again, and the word tells us just the opposite. If you were to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, Verses 22 and 23. If you were to go there, when we die, do we go back as a spirit presence or a flesh presence? Let's go there real quick. Let's just confirm this. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. And Isaiah is talking here. He is actually prophesying that something has not yet happened. And this is another argument that I have with many people. They want to say the Old Testament has been done away with. I say, well, how can that be when there's still unfulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament? That tells me the book has to be very much alive. So in Isaiah 66, verses 22, it says... For as the new heavens and the new earth, has that happened yet? Have we received the new heavens and the new earth? No. no. Which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, verse 23, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, well, wow, there's a great one. Hey, guess what? We're going to honor God on this holy Sabbath from one, one Sabbath to the next each week. That doesn't change. Why? Because God's word never changes. Amen? And it says, all what? 
all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. We will be flesh. We will have this brand new body, perfect. It'll be a body so different that we can't even begin to imagine. Jesus was able to appear in the midst of a room. I believe we're going to do the same thing. I really believe that. And so it's important to understand there's so much here, but yet this word commandment gets so trashed. You know, Jesus knows that keeping his commandments in this fallen world will require a divine source of power in the form of the Holy Spirit's presence living within us. Amen? We could do nothing without the power of God. We could do nothing without the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, we have a model for loving Jesus and keeping his commandments. To that the love of Jesus Christ and his life of obedience to the Father. And that, again, will come from John 14, 31. Obeying Christ's commands means copying the example that Jesus gave us. Amen? Let's go back. Let's go to John 13 again. John 13, verses 15 and 16. And we're going to wrap it up here. John 13, verses 15 and 16. Yes, John 13, verses 15 and 16. And Jesus says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent is greater than he who sent him. When Jesus was talking about John 14, 15, he was in the upper room, right? What did Jesus do in the upper room to prove that a servant is no greater than his master and vice versa? What did he do? Pastor Steve talked about last Sabbath, right? Wash the disciples' feet, amen? He led by an example. You know, loving Jesus is not merely a feeling. It is an active, abiding, ongoing relationship of following Jesus Christ. Amen? We should desire to want to obey our loving Master. He set the example before us. In, in 1 John 2, 3, it says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Do you know this word commandments in 1 John 2, 3 is the exact same word being used in John 14, 15 and in the Revelation. It is the exact same word. The New Testament believers are freed from the bondage of sin. Amen? That's because of his grace. And that's because the law frees us if we choose to honor him. Listen, bottom line is, it's only legalistic if you have to do it. You are free from the bondage of sin if you choose to honor him through his commandments. It is an outward display and an inward display <coughs> of our love to him. You know, as I said, New Testament believers are free from the bondage of sin, which allows them to freely leave out the Ten Commandments summarized by Christ in this way. And it says here uh, in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 34, you can write it down, but I'm going to read these. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these, the two commandments depend, the whole law and the prophets. What does it mean there? What does that last part mean, the whole law and the prophets? Who wants to answer that question? These two greatest commandments hinge on the whole law. Pastor Steve, what would you say that is? Well, the first, four, the first uh, part of the law is our commitment between us and God, and the last is our commitment between us and our fellow man. Absolutely. And that's what it's referring to, because everything God said hinges on those two principles. Absolutely. Amen. Do you understand that? Love your God with all your heart and all your mind falls back on the first four commandments that deal directly in God and our relationship with Him. The second greatest commandment, which I know some say Jesus gave a new commandment, but are you aware that the two greatest commandments come from the Old Testament? 
Are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. They come from the book of Deuteronomy, and I believe Leviticus, if that's correct. Word for word almost. Jesus just reiterated them because the world forgot about it. Just much like they forgot about his holy Sabbath. To remember the Sabbath day. So, I finish with this. John 14, 15. Let me ask you. Is it just another verse? Or is it a verse of the power of love of God? Jesus said, again, if you love me, keep my commandments. We are able to love him back because he first loved us by his grace. Amen? Closing song, John in the 14, we have this hope. Please stand.
as brothers and sisters in this beautiful church, let the love that you display be unconditional to one another that you give us freely through the blood of your son Jesus. And this is his name we pray. Amen. Amen.